over the last several weeks, we have been looking at the examples of less famous heroes from the Bible who have chosen to receive God's grand design and live the extraordinary life. We've looked at less famous heroes from the Old Testament. Some of you may have heard the name Shipra and Pua for the first time, and then you heard it about 30 more times in that service. We've learned about a nameless young hero in the Old Testament, whom we know is the servant of a general named Naaman's wife, but she had a vision from God. We've learned about a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who served in partnership in the Lord. Not only married partners, but partners in ministry. We've looked at different facets and different personalities, and today I want to lean into the example of one of my new favorite, less famous heroes of the New Testament, who set an example of the extraordinary life with faithfulness. Now, as we go into this, I, I kind of thought it would be appropriate to really define what faithfulness means. And within the church, there are a lot of words that we use that are kind of churchy words. It's kind of our internal jargon. <laughs> And it means something to us, but to the world around us, there may be a different meaning. And so I decided that I would turn to a secular definition of faithfulness. So I went to the website vocabulary.com and I found this definition. Faithfulness is commitment to someone or something. Faithfulness is especially valued in spouses and in sports fans. It continues. When a married person is faithful, they stand by their spouse and don't cheat. Faithfulness refers to this quality of being faithful and loyal. A patriotic person is full of faithfulness to their country. Someone who works at one company for decades has faithfulness to that company. People can have faithfulness to ideas too, including religious, political, and artistic ideas. One example of faithfulness that came to my mind came from a 2016 interview with Kurt Bandenhausen of Forbes magazine who interviewed Michael Phelps who's won an unparalleled 23 Olympic gold medals, three silver medals, and two bronze medals. In this interview, Phelps described his faithfulness to being the best swimmer he could be by explaining that he went five consecutive years without missing a single day of training in the pool, not even one. That's quite an example of faithfulness. You know, before I left for Africa in October, I had logged more than 118 consecutive days on an app called Duolingo that my daughter installed on my phone for my birthday last year so that I could start to learn Spanish. I have been married to a native Spanish speaker for almost 20 years, and I can now state, yo quiero una mesa para tres personas, <laughs> which means I would like a table for three people. <laughs> Oddly, there are four in our family, so somebody's not eating today. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you, I, I wasn't planning to share that little bit of knowledge with you, just kind of came in the moment and I couldn't remember quattro. <laughs> so I said, Trace, what a worm of a man I am. But I had built up to about 118 consecutive days in the Duolingo app, just five minutes a day in the morning as part of my morning routine. And then I went to Africa where with the 15-hour time change and the issues with the internet connectivity, I lost my streak. 
but I'm here to declare that as of this morning, I'm back at 121 days. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, that's not really even spiritual. You don't have to say amen to that. <laughs> I'm just messing around. But you know, it's funny because we really can be faithful to any number of things and faithfulness is defined by our consistency and our commitment. There's an example of faithfulness that's evident in Colossians chapter 1. An example set by a less famous hero of the Bible. And I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Colossians chapter 1, where we will begin reading at verse 6. Would you rise to your feet for the reading of the word of the Lord today? Colossians 1, 6 picks up in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for the examples that are found throughout the pages of Scripture, of men and women of faith who faithfully served you and share the good news with those around them, often at great risk of harm and physical peril, some so faithful even to the point of death. Father, as we examine this example, I pray in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, that we would recognize that you are faithful, and Lord, I pray that when you see us, you would recognize our faithfulness to you and to one another. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, Epaphras is mentioned three times in the New Testament, in three separate passages, twice in Paul's letter to the Colossians and once in Paul's letter to Philemon. Epaphras was from Colossa, which is an inland town near Ephesus in the Roman Empire. This is a part of the world that is now modern-day Turkey. It's interesting how that nation, which has turned in many ways away from God, is the site of some of the most powerful and dynamic moves of God in the first century, an area from which we draw our Christian heritage. Epaphras, scholars believe, may have been led to Christ by the Apostle Paul, who perhaps never visited Colossa himself. But he may have led Epaphras to Christ in Ephesus, and Epaphras may have subsequently helped to start the church in Colossa. We know that Paul credits him with bringing the gospel to many in that church. What we know about Epaphras from the few brief mentions of him in the New Testament are, first of all, that he was a faithful minister. Colossians 1.7 tells us, You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. Let me just say, I have a very firm grasp of the obvious here. When I tell you that he was a faithful minister, it's because Paul directly said he was a faithful minister. Guys, we don't know how he's have to dig really deep into Scripture to pick up on what God's saying, but we do have to pause not long enough to catch it. Many of us see Epaphras mentioned in a passage like this as we're reading through the Bible in a year, and we keep going. But he's mentioned as being a faithful minister, and so we're going to slow down and take a closer look. Pastor and Professor Calvin Miller offers a beautiful description of Christian faithfulness in his book, The Fruit of the Spirit, Faithfulness. Calvin Miller writes, Faithfulness always serves God's purposes. 
But often the mills of God grind slowly. Many times we only see God's enduring intentions in hindsight. Faithfulness instructs us how to live with purpose, but even better, we can pass it on to our children. Faithfulness is a gift anyone can give God, and he responds with a purpose for every morning's sunrise. Then at last, we are free. We live and have great reasons to live. That's a beautiful description of faithfulness from generation to generation. It's often said that if you love what you do, you will never work a day of your life. Perhaps this was the key to Epiphras' extraordinary life with faithfulness. You see, in him, we see the example of a whole lot of love. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 7, says, We learned it from Epiphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Now, Epiphras' name literally means lovely. I want to pause for just a moment because it's important for us to look at the Greek words that are translated into the English here because over and over again in the Greek, what's being conveyed is a message of love. There's a whole lot of love in this short passage. In English, we're using lots of different words, but when we look back at the Greek, we see that they all go back to love. Now, Epiphras, by the way, happens to be a shortened form of Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus is mentioned in the New Testament briefly. He's an even less famous hero of the Bible. And I know some of you might be confusing Epaphras with Epaphroditus because their names are so much alike. They both mean lovely. It's kind of like John and Jonathan. And I know some of you are going, wait, are we talking about Epaphras or Epaphroditus? Because I know you're really big fans of both of them. I want to make this super clear for you. Epaphroditus was from Philippi, but Epaphras was from Colossus. So that should clearly distinguish it. It's like talking about Jonathan from Philippi or John from Colossa. Their, their names are similar and interconnected, but they're two different guys. We're talking about Epaphras, the one from Colossa. We're going to stay focused on him. So let's, let's think about Epaphroditus maybe in another series on less famous heroes of the Bible, okay? Good with that? And some of you go, Pastor, I don't know what you are saying at all. Are you speaking in tongues right now? The answer is yes, I'm speaking in a tongue. It's called English. I'm going to throw a little bit of Greek in there just for fun. Epiphras means lovely. And Epiphras is a shortened form, a familiar form of the name Epaphroditus. So this is someone whom Paul calls lovely by name, but he's saying it in a very friendly manner. He calls him a dear fellow servant. And that translation of dear, it's, it, it's, it's like we write on a letter, you know, dear John. No, no not, not that kind of letter. <laughs> How about dear friend, dear loved one. But this dear in the Greek is agapetos. And now some of those who've been around the church for a long time, you've heard agape before. Agape is one of the Greek words that's directly translated as love. So this agape toss is lovely or be loved. So he's talking about his friend whose name means lovely, and he says, he's one whom I love. He's beloved to me. Lovely is a beloved fellow servant who has told us, we read in verse 8, of your love, of your agape. Nearly the same word. It's the root of how Paul describes Epaphras. This lovely fellow whom I deeply love, who is beloved to me as a fellow servant of Christ, he's told me of your love. There's a whole lot of love in this passage when we're talking about this faithful minister of Christ. Of course, the faithfulness of Epaphras is exemplified as he conveys the work of the Holy Spirit in Colossian Christians' lives. But Epaphras, who's a loving guy, isn't just a touchy-feely guy. He's a real team player. 
He's not just a spectator. He's not just a fan, but he's gotten into the action. You see, embracing the extraordinary life with faithfulness often involves cooperating with others to accomplish God's will. I felt the Spirit moved on my heart this morning as we were in prayer to lay hands on the missions team going to Dinuba with gleanings. And I felt it important that those who are looking to the example of our just older youth have the opportunity to lay hands on them and pray for them. Because we are in this together. We are one family, one team in Christ Jesus. And we must be faithful to one another. In Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 7, that statement that's made, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit, makes extra emphasis to show the interconnected relationship between this faithful minister, Epaphras, and those from whom he had received Christ and with whom he was sharing Christ. I don't know that a person can be a faithful minister and be disconnected. God's not looking for star athletes in ministry. He's looking for team players who will partner together and serve the Lord together. For me, one of the highlights of our annual board retreat this past week was being able to come together with those who have been called by God to lead in our church family and pray with one another. In fact, we didn't just put prayer on our agenda, we allowed prayer to set our agenda. And as we move forward as a church, we are committed to praying in the Spirit, praying with understanding, and praying in agreement. Because that is how we can truly be team players on God's team and live the extraordinary life with faithfulness. It appears that Epaphras brought the gospel to Colossa as an extension of Paul's missionary efforts. And he appears to have become a missionary from Colossan church who has rejoined Paul in Ephesus or in Rome when the letter to the church at Colossa was written. It's entirely possible that the Holy Spirit may have actually prompted Epaphras to encourage Paul to write what is now the book of Colossians in the New Testament to the church that sent him as a missionary. You see, what Epaphras has isn't just a faith that remains silent or a faith of, of deeply held convictions that are internalized, but his is a functional faith. Many times people talk about faith in terms of ideology, but I want you to really key in on the fact that faith, biblical faith, is functional faith. It seems that there's more emphasis on dysfunction these days than function, so let's look at how faith functions in our dysfunctional world. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 13, the Apostle Paul writes of Epaphras, I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Now, this is an important statement. To a church that has a heart for local, domestic, and world missions, it's important to know that our missions investments are actually accomplishing something and that the missionaries we support are doing the work of ministry. That's why every month we feature a missionary in the bulletin and we ask them to share a video with us so that we can see what's going on because we want to do more than just send financial support. We want to partner together with our brothers and sisters in Christ who are an extension of Radiant Life Church all over the world. And here, the Apostle Paul is sending a bulletin note to be printed in the bulletin 
in the Colossian church and to be shared with the Laodicean and the church in Hierapolis, because I don't know how to say Hierapolisian church. But he wants to make sure that these churches who've all supported Epaphras as a missionary to rejoin with Paul on his journey know that Epaphras isn't a slacker. He's not just collecting the support, but he is making good use of the seeds that are being sown into him, and he is fertilizing, and he is bringing about fruit for Christ Jesus. He is working hard, we're told. Now, it's important for us as followers of Jesus Christ to recognize that that hard work is part of the Christian journey, but it's the why we work hard that's so important. We don't work hard in order to earn God's favor. No, we do what God calls us to do because we've already received God's favor. It's evidence of our faith. That's exemplified when the half-brother of Jesus, James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote in James 2, beginning at verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, I have faith. I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. I want to tell you, as followers of Jesus Christ, this passage of Scripture ought to hit us right between the eyes. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Here's the reality. None of us are dead. A couple of us might be dozing off, but none of us are dead. Oh, there I'm seeing the smiles. I'm seeing the eyes. Okay, okay, we're all alive. Good, good. None of us are dead, so our faith shouldn't be dead either. Because the object of our faith is Jesus Christ, and Jesus is alive. And we know that our faith is alive when our faith is accompanied by actions that are consistent with our faith. That is how we show ourselves to be faithful. Living the extraordinary life with faithfulness seldom leaves anyone questioning what we believe because our relentless devotion to Jesus is consistently evident in everything we say and do. It's impossible to be faithful to God without being faithful in our prayer life. That would be like Being married to someone without ever having a conversation with them. Ladies, do not elbow your husband in the ribs right now. I said without ever having a conversation with him. Can you imagine as a married person, your spouse coming to you one day and saying, sweetheart, I feel like I have really been faithful to you. I have only cheated on you a few times. I have been mostly faithful. Most days of the year, I don't think about anybody but you. I'm pretty faithful. There's no such thing as pretty faithful. There's no such thing as mostly faithful. You are either faithful or you are unfaithful. How many of you know you only have to cheat on your spouse one time to be called unfaithful? But how many of you know that when we are faithful to the one that we love, We build a relationship on a firm foundation that no matter what storms may blow, we can stand together. Christ has been faithful to us. He has set for us an example that we might be faithful to him, not just some of the time, but all the time. And I have to tell you, it's hard to have a strong, faithful relationship without communication. Colossians chapter 4, verse 12 says, Ephaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Can I tell you that Every morning when our church office opens up at 8.35, our office staff and anyone on campus, everyone on campus meets together in the lobby for prayer. 
And generally, I start with a simple question. What prayer needs do we have this morning? Sometimes I have a stack of those connection cards that are in seat backs with needs that people have written down and dropped into the offering that have been placed in my box so that when we come together and pray, we can pray specifically for the needs of people in this church. There are occasions where we'll look around and be like, I don't know, haven't, haven't really heard anything. And many times as we begin to pray, God will remind us of some of those persistent needs, some of those chronic needs that so easily we can say, well, I've been praying for that and I haven't seen God take action. But see, we're called to be faithful in prayer. There are even people in our church family that I have seen week after week after week after month after year of the same prayer requests because they are faithful and they are holding on to the promises of God that he hears every prayer and that he can meet every need and they're not giving up. I wonder if maybe there's somebody here that even at this moment you think, man, it's been a long time since I've prayed for God to bring a healing. It's been a long time since I've prayed for that person to draw nearer to Christ. I'm not going to think you're distracted if you reach into the seat back in front of you even right now and just grab one of those cards and jot down a prayer request. What I can promise you is that the pastors and the staff of this church will be faithful to continue to pray with you for those needs. And here's the other thing I want to ask. Would you be faithful and let us know when God answers a prayer? Because we want to be faithful and celebrate together what God is doing. You should be fully assured that in this church, we are committed to always wrestling for one another in prayer. Epiphras was relentless in his prayer for the Colossian church because he knew that God was capable of doing great things through them whether they knew it or not. Can I tell you, I look out and I see a great army. A great army of followers of Jesus Christ who can be God's instrument of transformation in this community and around the world. I see many who have not slipped back into the comfort zone but are pressing forward to go to places like Dinuba and Vicente Guerrero and even here in Lodi to make an impact for Jesus. I see missionaries to our school campuses, to workplaces, to neighborhoods. I see the people of God who are called by his name to be faithful to the one who has been faithful to us. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 offers possibly the authoritative and greatest definition of Christian faith that you will find anywhere. Hebrews 11.1 1 reads, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You might say that prayer is the act of breathing into our faith as we converse with God who breathes life into the impossible. Faith isn't just wishful thinking. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And when we pray, we put breath into our faith. And we invite the breath of God to accomplish what may be impossible for us. And this is challenging because many times we get excited, we get pumped up, we start praying in the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit of God begins to pray with us and even through us. We begin to experience that dynamic interaction, and then we step into a dark and bleak world. And many times, the reality is that our world is filled with hardship and difficulty. Epiphras was probably on top of the world when he met Jesus. When Paul told him 
how Christ Jesus could transform his life. He was probably on top of the world when he went to Colossa into this pagan city and he began to share the good news of Jesus and people's lives were turned around and transformed. Oh sure, some were throwing tomatoes, but many were throwing up their arms toward heaven and receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. He may have even been on top of the world when this church that he loved and helped to plant said, we want you to go back and we want you to come beside Paul, who is a prisoner in chains. We want you to encourage him and support him and make sure his letters get out because the Holy Spirit is giving him what we need in our churches today. Oh, he may have been on top of the world right up until that moment that shackles were placed on his wrists because at some point, Epaphras turned the corner from being a pastor to being a prisoner. Often we look down on those who are behind bars, but he was behind bars for his faith in Jesus Christ and his bold proclamation of the gospel because he was a faithful minister. We read in Philemon, verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. I don't know when it happened or how it happened, but at some point he turned the corner from visiting Paul in prison to now being in prison for his faith. And there was a lot of evidence against him because he was faithful to God. Well, it's impossible for us to fill in all the blanks. It is possible for us to understand that Epaphras and Paul were both in prison when the letter to the Colossian church was written. Epaphras may have been visiting Paul or he may have been behind bars with him. It's also possible that Epaphras was a free man when the letter to the Colossian church was written. But Paul wrote the New Testament's shortest letter to a man named Philemon at a point in time when it is certain that Epaphras had joined Paul's behind bars. As followers of Jesus, there are many kinds of hardship that we may face. Physical, relational, financial, emotional, legal, and sometimes our circumstances bring temptation that threatens our faith because we want to get out of the jam we're in. Some compromise. Some give in to temptation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we read, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Friends, God is faithful faithful, and we are created in his likeness. When our faith is weak, he remains faithful to us, and we can lean into him. It's hard to get everything right all the time. It's hard to be faithful. Just this morning, I awoke when my alarm went off and I rebuked it in Jesus' name. (laughs) With the touch of a button, I gave myself about eight more minutes in peace and darkness, comfort beneath the blankets. And then that thing, as though a demoniac had overcome it, began to make noise again. And again, I rebuked it for eight more minutes. But a third time, the alarm went off, and alas, I knew that if I stayed in bed, I would be unfaithful to God's call in my life. And so I went through my morning routine, and I I got ready, and I'm watching the clock, and I'm listening to the Word of God being read to me by a guy with a British voice on my Bible app. So I brushed my teeth and shaved and placed my order for a cold brew at a place here on Ham Lane. I rushed out the door and 
I actually crossed over Ham before I realized my order was probably waiting for me on the counter, but I didn't make the left turn, so I had to make a U-turn. I went in and I grabbed that Trenta iced cold brew. Mm, hallelujah. I walked back out to my car with it in my hand, ready for the morning. I jumped in the car. As I began to put my car into reverse, I looked into the rearview mirror and I realized that I had failed to comb my hair. (laughs) Sitting on the counter with me this morning were all the products I needed, the gel and the spray. I just needed to put a little gel in my fingers and run it through my now gray locks. But alas, I had failed. One step in the process. I had to decide, was I going to come straight to the church or save myself the embarrassment of seeing folks with (laughs) hair? So I came and fired off a text. I told Siri, text my wife. I forgot to comb my hair this morning. Would you bring the hairspray and the gel? Then I left her a voicemail. And having not received a response within 15 minutes of arriving on our campus, I called her again. Dripping wet, she answered the phone and let me know that she had been in the shower. But she was faithful to me and brought me what I needed. See, sometimes in our weakness, we can lean on others to help us. That's why we have a church family, friends. You know, when the book of Revelation describes the havoc that comes with the mark of the beast in the end times, we are encouraged to remain faithful even under the most difficult of circumstances. We are encouraged to remain faithful to the one who has already claimed the victory. Would you get that picture off the screen? Thank you, in Jesus' name. (laughs) Revelation chapter 14, beginning at verse 12, tells us this calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. We don't develop endurance instantly. Endurance comes through faithful adherence to beneficial discipline. Let me repeat that. We don't develop endurance instantly. Endurance comes through faithful adherence to beneficial discipline. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, we read, This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The extraordinary life with faithfulness means loving God and loving others. The extraordinary life with faithfulness means choosing to be a team player. The extraordinary life with faithfulness means remaining constant in prayer, and the extraordinary life with faithfulness means enduring hardship well. Friends, God knows our weaknesses. He knows that along the way we'll stumble, and he has given us his word as a guide to help us to be faithful. He has given us one another, so that we might support and encourage each other through his word. And he has given us sufficient grace that covers over a multitude of sin because he knows that at times we will struggle to be faithful. And he's declared, my grace is sufficient for you. This then is how I pray the world would regard us, not as having figured it all out, not as having attained perfection, for we have not, but as servants of Christ, 
and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed through his word. Now it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Friends, we've been trusted. May we be found faithful. Jesus.